Let us really see how you fight your battle. Let us see how you fight your battle. I mean, this is the way to fight your battle. You give God praise and let God give you a good warfare on your behalf and great victory in his name. Come on. Oh, it is how I fight. Come on. Am I the only one ready to fight? This is how I fight my battle. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Because the battle is yours and the victory is ours in your name. And we thank you for everyone who has rejoiced tonight. Has not only rejoiced for what you have done, but they are rejoicing in advance of what they have to receive. And so shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty. Come on. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for victory. We thank you for your joy. We thank you for the joy of salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. So very quickly before we sit down, Matthew chapter 12. Because it's one of those nights if we don't quickly grab a scripture, we may actually not be doing all that teaching today. We're just going to be fighting that battle in praise and worship style. Well, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But let's see if we can proceed with one scripture and then we'll take it from there. Alrighty, God is good. I noticed that um, Shannon and the kids just went that way. Can someone help me make sure that they get to Ms. Sharon's class? Because they knew I want to make sure that they get to the right class. So we thank you. I appreciate that greatly. So look at Matthew chapter 12 verse 19 very quickly. Matthew chapter 12 verse 19 is going to be our scripture for the night. Standing. Because you know the Bible says, Come bless the Lord, O you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. So it's typically, or let me say it's become customary of us to read a scripture standing in the house of the Lord. And verse 19 of Matthew chapter 12 says, He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and his name, in his name, Gentiles will trust. Folks, as we were in that bout of worship and we were shouting and giving our praise shout, it just occurred to me that the Bible says that his voice will not be heard. <laughs> but guess what? Your voice has to be heard. You see, there are times when God really lets us see the dynamics of the relationship that he has with us and the partnership that we have with him. When God came to push down the walls of Jericho, no one heard his voice. No one knew he was coming. The only voices they heard and the sounds that were audible were the sounds of the trumpets and the voices of the people that were praising God. And God is reminding you that he wants to come in on your behalf in stealth mode. But for him to not be heard at all, is usually beneficial for your voice to be so loud, for your voice to be so heard 
so that he is working while you were praising. I don't know about you tonight, but I want my voice to be heard in praise. I want my shout to be heard in praise. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you. God is good. Hallelujah. All righty, let's be seated. Praise God. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All righty, so I just want to give us a heads up in case you haven't noticed. Anytime you come to service and you see Christian, then be prepared to stay till 10 o'clock. Because I think he has, he has the anointing to drag services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tonight I'm not blaming it on Bennett or anybody else. He's all Christian today. God is good. All righty, so while we're seated, we're just going to go right into it. And I want to share a couple of things, and then Lady Z will come for her testimony. And I know y'all have been waiting for that testimony. I have. I've been waiting so eagerly. Um, and on Saturday, she wasn't here, but I did say on your behalf that you're coming with records today just so that, uh, hallelujah, to make it as apparent as possible. Mr. B., and Shannon, good to see you guys. I'm glad you guys made it all the way from Hiram. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. So, um, I don't think anyone else drove from further away than you did tonight. If your drive was more than an hour tonight, let me see your hand. Okay, John, John is, yeah, John typically, yeah. Okay, yeah, but, but then at the end of the day, apart from John, it's just them two. Let's just celebrate them, everybody. Let's just give God thanks. Praise God. All right. So we're going to go right into it, and um, uh, Lady Z will come up for her testimony while the band is still here, because I think testimonies just sound better with a little bit of um, instrumentation. Yeah, so um, come on, praise God, praise the Lord. Let's celebrate her as she comes up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, come up, come up here. Come up, come up here. Oh, yes, come up here. Hallelujah. Do we have another microphone just... Um, one that is not kind of like locked down to this voice. If we can just grab one, that'll be real. That'll be real awesome. And I enjoyed worship so much today that um, praise God. I actually bumped into Antoine, and I wasn't even sorry. You know, sometimes you step on people and you feel the need to apologize. Like I'm sorry. I bumped into him, and I'm like, yeah, I did it. Yeah. At least now you're my witness that I was having such a good time. I can apologize later, but I'm still having fun. Praise the Lord. God is good. And you know what happened a couple of services ago? It might have been just a week ago, actually. So that was Tuesday last week. After we got home, I saw a vision of Messiah joining my wife and I for worship. Wow. And then I don't think he came on Saturday. So I was like, okay, well, I don't know. And then I kind of forgot about it until today. I was in worship and then he came and he tapped me. Oh. And when he tapped me, I was like, man, does he get any better than this? The Messiah <laughs> is right next to me. <laughs> yeah. So if you're pregnant and it's a boy or not, the name Messiah is a good one. That's a good name. You know, because I just, I felt, it just felt right, you know, to have Messiah. So thank you for blessing us with the Messiah's presence today. I appreciate that greatly. God is good. Alrighty, so Lady Z is here. We've heard parts of your testimony, but we want to hear it again with the records. And we're just so happy to celebrate with you because this is what the Lord has done. Yes. You know, there's this song that my wife and I would love to sing. See what the Lord has done. Yes. What we've been waiting for oh has come to pass. Oh my God. See what the Lord has done. Enjoy this news of God's goodness. God bless you, Sister Z. Praise the Lord, everybody. So I have, you see this stack of papers. These are all hospital and doctor papers. And the first one I have here is dated set, uh, July 22nd, 2022. And it talks about me being admitted into Piedmont Hospital. And I was there for two days. I went there because I had gone to a regular doctor's visit 
And just by the spirit of the Lord, a nurse, when I was leaving, said, let me check your blood sugar. And she checked my blood sugar and said, you need to go immediately to the hospital. She said, I, I'm either going to call the ambulance or somebody's going to have to take you. And I went to the hospital that day and I did not leave till three days later. And what they told me at that time was that I had full blown out of, their exact words was out of control diabetes. My blood sugar, um, my A1C was over 14. It was over 14, which meant that for the past prior three months that my blood sugar was um, averaging 380 or more. And so, at that time, they kept me in the hospital because they wanted to test all my organs because they said with blood sugar that high that they were afraid that there was damage to my heart and kidneys and everything. And so I did stress tests and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to tell you, I went to the hospital at that time. They prescribed me four when I was released. They couldn't get my blood, uh, blood sugar down below 220, but the doctor still released me to go home. They had prescribed me four shots of insulin a day and six medications. I went from having no medication to four medications. So I took those medications just like they told me to, y'all. Just like they told me I was afraid of this disease because it had caused my father, my father had it, and he went blind and he lost limbs because of diabetes. So it ran in a family. So I was pretty kind of afraid. Um, but I went back um, to, well, I went to the hospital several times in between then and when I went to the endocrinologist finally in November. This is the paperwork from November. When I went to the endocrinologist after taking those four shots every day and those six pills, my A1C had only gotten down to 9.1. So that still meant that it was averaging more than 200 for those past three months, which was what I was doing when I left the hospital. So when I went to the endocrinologist on November the 20th, I was driving home and I was a little discouraged and I called and I was talking to my son. And my son said, mom, I just don't think that God wants you to take all that medication. And something hit me when he said that because I was discouraged. And something hit me when he said that because I had been eating everything I was supposed to eat and doing everything I was supposed to do and I still wasn't seeing any progress. So I decided that day that I wasn't going to take another pill, another shot. I didn't take anything. And I just listened to the word of God through my son. Let's fast forward. I like fast forwarding. Uh, four months later, I go back to the doctor. <laughs> Here it is. When I went back to the doctor, my A1C was 5.9. The doctor said, so my blood sugar was 89, y'all. 89. My weight, I was down 35 pounds. And my A1C was 5.9. And my doctor said it was too good. And so I said, why did you say it was too good? She said, because I needed it to be at least 6.4 for me to be able to prescribe you any medication. So she, she couldn't even prescribe me medication because my blood sugar was too, my A1C was too low. And she said it was too good. And I said, no, my God is too good. just want to add this one thing we had prayer and everybody saw the day when my arm I got a release in the spirit through praise and worship that my shoulder that had been seized up for a month 
I couldn't raise it over my head and I got an instant healing. And so that next week, uh, Pastor Moses had another prayer and he called people here who needed healing. And I stood right here and he said, what do you need healing? I said, high blood pressure and diabetes. And he spoke over my life. Nobody knew what was going on. He spoke over my life that day and said, you will never have to take another man-made medication another day in your life. So this is proof. This is proof that the word of God is true. That the word of God is true. The Lord. Proof. Praise this the is Lord. Proof. God is good. Come on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Come on. Folks, I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you. Folks. Um, <laughs> I want to encourage you to key in to that. You see, because I don't think that God loves her more than he loves me, more than he loves you. Because the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. He is love. That is who he is. It's not some love. God is love. And so when you hear a testimony like that, it becomes a weapon in your hands. You know, the Bible says that and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of their testimony. That is the word of her testimony, that she heard a reminder word of what the will of God is for her. And she tapped into it. And from that moment, the Lord began to order her steps. Remember that day that your shoulder was healed. When I spoke to her, I said, you already received your healing before coming here. Because I knew that someone received their healing while worship was going on. And so this is it. This is what the Bible says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Praise the Lord. I just want you to say that one more time. Oh yeah, God is good. God is good. I would want for you to just take a moment and say, Lord, I am not just getting excited, I'm getting activated. If I were you, I would bow my heads wherever I'm at and I'm going to tap into that very moment. Before we do that, let me share something with you real quick. I want to share something with you real quick. Jesus had raised the dead. He had opened the eyes of the blind. He had performed several miracles. But there was really no record of everybody getting healed until the woman with the issue of blood. Until she came and said, if I may but touch the hem of his garments, I know that I will be made whole. And the Bible says she did, she was made whole, and afterwards people came from all the regions around to touch the hem of his garment, and every single one of them got healed. There is something to be said about one person encountering the healing power of God. It opens the door for others to do the same. And so if you need healing in your body, if you need some kind of divine intervention that's become pretty urgent, this is the moment for you to tap into it just like the Lady Z did and received her miracle. Let us not just make this a moment of her testimony. Let this also become the moment of your own miracle. Take this moment, press hard and press in so that you do not leave any bread of miracle on the table. It is yours because healing is the children's meat. If it is high blood pressure, no matter what it is, the word of the Lord that God gave me to her on one of those days that I was praying with her was that that which was called terminal was being terminated. The word of the Lord to you today is that this is your moment 
to tap in, to press in and touch the hem of his garment. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because while we were yet thanking you, you were doing another miracle. And so we thank you continually because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Emmanuel, is there a way I can hear myself a little more? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that's excellent. Alrighty, God is good. Amen, amen. Let's all be seated. Sister Natalie, congratulations on your event. Even though we couldn't stay till the very end of it, the little glimpse that we, we caught was, was a great experience. And we just thank God for you and your son and your heart and your dedication. These days, they just want to look after themselves, you know, but we thank God that you are, you know, almost in some cases, squeezing water out of stone just to make sure that someone else is not thirsty beyond encountering you. So don't worry. You know how it is. If my wife reminded me of something concerning you today, how the word of the Lord keeps coming through for you every time you're about to hit another milestone. And so you're close to another milestone today. And if you would hark in your heart, that word is coming forth today to let you know what's about to happen. I'm going to just give you a little snippet. You see that which is in your hand that has been sort of a basket that is not able to hold all of what God has given to you is about to be replaced with a vessel that can hold and retain. A vessel that can hold and retain. You're no longer doing the pass-through business. You see, that's what it is. As I saw the basket, I was pressing in and the Lord will have me say to you, you're no longer doing the pass-through business. You know exactly what I mean, wherein you're literally just having the resources pass through you to pay other people. You're about to be able to retain. It is your season to retain. And I want to encourage the rest of you. Sometimes we don't see Natalie because she's overseas, she's traveling, she's doing this and that. But this woman's consistency and faithfulness in serving, in supporting the house and in supporting other people is worthy of commendation. And I believe that's the reason why you never miss a word whenever you need one. God bless you. Thank God for the example that you are. Praise the Lord. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Alrighty. So I think if we can finally um, release the gentleman here, praise God. Now, on Saturday, there was a word of God that came forth for our brother Antoine. He came in during worship, and as soon as he came close, the Lord said to me, he needs to practice his testimony. Let me tell you something. Your testimony is a living testimony because it's already giving birth to other testimonies. I got a call from a couple yesterday, and they called me very late at night, and I called them back even later, and... I was expecting that by that time, it would probably be a voicemail. But they were also in the spirit. They knew that call was going to come anyway. And so when they picked the phone, they said to me, they said, man of God, we were the ones that the testimony of Antoine was about. I said, well, I, in my heart I was thinking, well, Antoine may not agree with you because he really pressed into that testimony. And they said, we had a business that was about to be shut down. The people with the power to shut it down already decided that that was what they were going to do. They were going to walk away and shut the door behind them. But the woman said, I held on knowing fully well that we had a word from God to start the business. She said they had gone through several challenges with the business. But the very moment of attending that final meeting to close the business completely, she remembered the divine orchestration that led to the birth of that business. You see, when the Bible says, do not forget his benefits. When God says to you, don't forget, it's because he knows things will happen in such a way that you will be tempted or even compelled to forget. You know, many of us forget how we got here. Many of us forget very quickly the things that we survived. Many of us, we forget how we strolled through the Red Sea that could have caved in on us. 
Pharaoh wasn't so lucky, but you were that blessed. But we so often forget, and we forget so easily. When Jesus was promising the Holy Spirit, I mean, look at the Holy Spirit, the power of the Godhead, diverse in his operations. And yet, of the first three things that Jesus would tell us about the Holy Spirit, he said he will bring to your remembrance. He says he will be the teacher, he will be the comforter. He will bring to your remembrance as the one that is called alongside because God knows that that is one of the primary weaknesses of man. In the morning of Friday, God told Adam and Eve, he said to Adam, of the tree of this fruit, you shall not eat. Which was about 11 a.m. But before the end of that same day, do you know that Adam and Eve never slept in the garden? It was that same day. In the morning, when he made them, he told them that. But by evening, they had forgotten. Quite often, we think that, oh, Adam and Eve were there for like six months. And after their honeymoon, they backslided and forgot what God said. No, it was the same day. And guess what happens? God never forgets. And so God knows that that is the biggest issue with some of us most of the time. That we so easily forget that God is good. We forget that God is able. We forget who we are. We forget that we are children of God. Quite often, we cry and run to things when your heavenly father is there with his arms forever open and you forget. The reason why the prodigal son suffered for as long as he suffered was not because he wasted his resources. The father already knew that he wasn't going to do anything with it. He made provisions already. But the reason why he suffered for that long was because he forgot who he was. The Bible says the moment he remembered, he said to himself that even the servants in my father's house have it better than this. So the moment you remember who God is, who you are, and what he has said concerning you, it is over. So we need to keep getting reminded. And so what happened, this, the lady, the wife said, I remembered that we wouldn't have had that business in the first place. If God had not done this, if God had not done that. And so she said, immediately hope rose within her. And you know what happened? The same people, just like the word of God that came forth for you, that were about to shut the door, saying that they were done being involved and helping the business. One of them stood back. And rather than shutting the door behind him, he shut himself in. And he says to even ensure that I don't change my mind, I'm about to double my investment. This business will not die, but live. Let me tell you something, as though that was not enough, the other people who could not make it in, he said, I knew already that the one coming, so I am going to pay their part of the investment. This business will not die, but live. Let me tell you something, I don't know about you, but whenever someone is testifying or someone is receiving the word, that word is not coming from the father who adopted them and neglected me. That word is coming from the same father who loves us all and adopted us all in the Holy Spirit. And so I will never be a second class citizen in God's kingdom. Kingdom. That word, if it's good enough for one to one, it is good enough for me. And I'm going to remind us of the words that we've been receiving lately. And I want to say this again, if you need healing in your body, don't just wait for something to happen. It is already happening. And so I want you to just key into it. Just key into it. And I want you to just drive unforgiveness far from you. Unforgiveness needs to be out of the window. Unforgiveness needs to be out of the window. Resentment needs to be, how, needs to be out of the room. Anybody who comes to your mind, regardless of what they have done, how much they have hurt you, just let them go. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Nobody who truly knows your worth will want to hurt you. We all want to be in the good books of good people. Let me say that again. You know, the other, just about yesterday, I think it was, I had just about had enough of this idolatry that is in our generation. These 
spate of recklessly worshipping people. We have become so... <laughs> I mean, what is the word? Yeah, that, that too. We become so <laughs> infatuated with celebrity status. To the point wherein many people have suspended the call of God on their lives to fan the flame of fame. Because it's like, man, people have come to recognize that when you're famous, you get treated different. You ask little children today, what do you want to be? Famous. What do you want to be famous for? It doesn't matter. Just want to be famous. You see, people are not looking to be known for the fruits they bear or the contribution they make. They just want to be known for being known sake. And you and I, we know several people today who are just famous for being famous. They add no value to anybody's lives, if anything at all, if we're not careful and we let our children get exposed to them. Some of our children start to consider them as role models, but in reality, they are on a road going nowhere. And so you don't want your children thinking of them as anything. We're not throwing shades, we're not trying to talk down on anybody, but we need to pull down the altars of Satan. Because several people are on these pedestals that we have placed them and that is not doing anything for us. And I was just, I went to the back of the house and I was just thinking about it. And in the last week or so, I have been in this mindset of, okay, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just, I'm just going to pray about it. You know, because sometimes, you know, we're good at talking about all of what's going on in the world. You can analyze the president and the vice president. You can analyze, you know, the, the billionaires and the corporations. We can do all of that. We become experts. Every one of us, we've become political pundits. You understand what I mean? Just busy talking, talking, talking. But I want us to begin to think of ourselves as who we truly are. We are the body of Christ. And the Bible says that the government shall be upon his shoulders. That means the thinking cap of the church or what we call the leadership mind of the body of Christ, of the ecclesia, should primarily be responsible for the governance and administration of our world. But we don't think like that anymore. We just think we, we need to outsource governance to other people so that we can just go to church on Sunday and be good people. Well, you can try to be a good person in an evil world. world is not as fun from what we can see. And so I said, I'm not just going to talk about it, but I'm going to pray about it. And before I started praying about it, you know what the Lord said to me? He said to me, he said, you know the solution to the problem. He said, if we, talking about us, his children, he says, if you would love one another as I love you, nobody would want to be a celebrity. Let me say that again. You see, Jesus says, love your neighbors as yourself. That was when he was still encouraging the disciples to come out of that, come out from their religious mentality. And then as soon as he got them close enough, he then showed them the real agenda. He said, love one another as I have loved you. Now, think about it for a moment. The moment the Lord said it to me, because you know when God gives you a word of revelation like that, it comes with light. It doesn't have to explain. You just see what he's saying. I immediately saw what he was saying. And what did I see? I saw that the reason why several people would sell their soul and add their pinky to the deal to become celebrities is because they like how they get treated. When you go to places you want to be recognized. You see what I mean? People that have never met you, when they meet you, what do they do? They celebrate you. And that's why they're called celebrities. You understand what I mean? And once you've had a taste of it, many people become obsessed. In fact, people who haven't had a taste of it are obsessed simply because we are made in the image in image and in the likeness of God. And the Bible says that God is worthy of praise. So if we're not careful, we want to take on that particular role of God and we want to be people who are worthy of praise. Come on, every single one of us, we like to be 
We like, we like compliments. We like people to recognize what we're doing well. You understand what I mean? You know, I wish we were that enthusiastic about being corrected. You know, when you think you've, you're doing well and someone tells you, man, Brandon, I, I, I like the way you spoke to that man. That was good. <laughs> you're like, hey, it's nothing. <laughs> Woo! But in your heart, you're doing backflips and you're somersaulting and you're breakdancing because someone just acknowledged you. I wish we were that sincere so that when someone comes to you and says, Josephine, you know you could have done that better. You, if, I mean, I wish she would say, <laughs> that's me, <laughs> the one who can do better. You see, but we take it very personal and we're like, what do you mean? What if it was you? I don't take that. But in any case, what I was saying is we like the way celebrities are treated. But do you know that if we treat each other like that, if you celebrate everyone that you meet as though they just won a Grammy, Everybody, you see, what do celebrities enjoy? You see them at the airport and you want to take pictures with them. I've seen people fight their husbands over taking pictures with celebrities. There was this video that went viral the other day. The lady left her children and the husband in the middle of the road because a celebrity was passing just to get a selfie. She was there with her hands raised like the wings of a vulture just to get a selfie. And the man was just standing there looking abandoned. On top of it all, the celebrity was a man too. So imagine that kind of enthusiasm if we show it to everyone we meet. We meet, why would anybody then strike a deal with Satan to become famous? Why would anybody abandon their God-given calling just to be popular? Do you know how many ministers today, when you see them, you can see a shadow of the anointing? You can tell that there was once the anointing in that life. But now they have stopped teaching the revelations that come by the anointing simply because it does not bring the kind of crowd that they have become accustomed to. Let me tell you something. <laughs> my wife and I, we see these things all the time. The other day I told my wife, I said, you see those two people. They cannot be ministers in America. Why? Because the way they are celebrated in their home country is almost as if they have been worshipped. I said, if they come to America and someone dares to call him by his first name, he will call down fire from heaven because he's used to being called Papa or whatever they call him. You understand what I mean? And so many people will not do anything that will make them forfeit that kind of worship. And you and I both know that when God told his, when Jesus told his disciples what it means to be a true servant, he says you must be ready. If you want to be the greatest, you must be ready to be the servant of all. But now, the greatest amongst us in our religious circles are not the servants, but they are the ones that are served by all. If you don't buy their book, they may not pray for you. If you don't pay to go to their conference, they will stop talking to you. You can ask my wife. Some people don't talk to her anymore because she refused to pay to go to a conference. You see, and that's because people think what it means to be a kingdom person is to strive to have some kind of hierarchy over other people that will then allow for them to serve you. When Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, you're the boss. You didn't have to wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you do not have a part in me. Peter was like, oh, I was just being silly. Wash my head also. <laughs> you see what I mean? And Peter was just being, he was just being courteous. You know, he was like, man, this is not right. He is the rabbi. I mean, I'm here to learn. Who am I? Why should he wash my feet? But Jesus was setting an example of what we should do for one another. You understand what I'm saying? And so, if we want to complain all day long about the idolatry in the world, we need to start with our own selves. How have we contributed and how are we contributing 
to this worship of celebrities. When you treat people casually just because they don't have a title, when you treat people casually just because their car is not as nice as yours. I told you the example the other day where I, when I went somewhere and somebody greeted me casually. I didn't even notice because I wasn't expecting her to bow down and say, Hail to the king. She greeted me. I greeted her. And then after a while, she just came back. She was like, oh, I am so sorry. I didn't know it was you. You remember the story? I thought to myself in that moment, so what does it matter? So you came back now greeting me nicely. Why? Because of what exactly? What was I this moment that I was in two minutes ago? You understand what I mean? I, I am like my father. I changed at north. I, was, I came here. As Moses Anderson, I'm still Moses Anderson. What made the difference was because she went inside and someone said, oh, did you see who was outside? And they told her that it was me. And for some reason, her demeanor changed. And suddenly now I am worthy of some love and respect. I, I, I didn't appreciate it very much. Because I would have appreciated better if she had greeted me lovingly when I was just a stranger. Jesus says, be kind to strangers, for by so doing, some have unknowingly entertained angels. I would rather celebrate you to the point where you are suspicious. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's better for you to become suspicious of how much I'm celebrating you than for me to miss an opportunity to give God glory for yet another man or woman made in his image and in his likeness. When I celebrate people, it's because of the revelation that I have. If I let me tell you something, there are certain people, you will love on them, you will celebrate them, but it will be too much for them because even they themselves don't know who they are. Oh yeah, I told my wife once before, about three years ago or two years ago, there was a young man who came to our fellowship meeting. And I said to my wife, I said, I am convinced that he doesn't know or he hasn't accepted what God says about him. But because of my office as a prophet, I was seeing things and I was relating to him based on what I was seeing and he just couldn't receive it. You understand what I mean? But I will not deprive myself because of someone else's rebellion because you know what we do? We always say things like, well, if that person wants to be treated that way, who am I? No, no. Who you are, I will tell you. Who you are is someone who does not repay evil with evil, but one who overcomes evil with good. Some people will present to you that they should be treated badly. Because their behavior is foul. They have a horrible behavior. A behavior that stinks. But that doesn't mean you should accept them as less than who God says they are. Let us love people unconditionally. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh yes, while we were yet sinners. The Bible says, for a righteous man, hardly would anybody die. Even if you're righteous and you're as nice as Antoine, no one's going to die for you. No. I mean, the money has to be like a lot. Or some kind of reward. You see? But why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why? The Bible tells us why he died for us. He didn't die for us because of where we, we were at. He died for us because of where we could be. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, because he knew that if he, would, if he would just die for us, as that grain of wheat that falls to the ground, he will have the opportunity of having us raised unto the Father as heirs of salvation together with him. Jesus was aware of the fullness of the riches of the Father's glory to the point wherein he was like, I'm not going to be the only one. You know, the Bible says he is the only begotten son of God. Not the only son. You know, because some song says, oh, Jesus is the only son of God. Oh, amen. Okay, only Nigerians sing that song. 
As soon as I sang it, then it occurred to me that y'all would not even know that song. But that song has been banned from churches who know what they're doing. Because Jesus is not the only son. He's the only begotten. We were not begotten. We were adopted. But it's okay. He, he chose us. Yes. He chose us. Some people didn't get chosen. The Bible says many were called, but only a few were chosen. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 I don't want to hurt your feelings because the moment I says we were adopted, I noticed that things got quiet in the room. So let me give you a scripture so you can take it up with Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit. And you and I can be friends again. <laughs> yeah, because the way I saw Kayla's looks, she was like, okay. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 15 that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba. Father. We are able to call God Father because of the adoptive process of the Holy Spirit. And while you're still trying to accept it, let me give you another one. You see, God, the Bible says, his throne is in heaven. Right? And he has sons in heaven. There are sons of God. So anyone that was made in heaven, that was created in heaven, is a son of God. So that is their citizenship. But when Adam was made, Adam was made from the dust of the earth, but because he was made and fashioned unto a heavenly father, he was also called a son of God. Adam was the very first person in history who had dual citizenship. Michael, the angel, even though he's an archangel, he's a son of God. He comes to the earth on assignment. He's not from here. Right? Several angels that have come here, we've, we, we saw the account of the angel that was bringing Daniel's blessing and was stopped along the way because when he got to the port of entry, they didn't grant him visa to come in. The prince of Persia was like, this region is my own. Where are you going? And he had to wait until someone with a higher authority came. And even when that one came, Michael, he came in the name of God. But when you look at Adam, Adam had both the citizenship of heaven and that of the earth. So the fact that we are not begotten or the fact that we were not born in heaven does not mean that we are less privileged. In fact, if anything at all, it gives us the utmost advantage of dual citizenship. It was so cleverly masterminded by God that we will be born of water, which is what it means to be born on the earth. So when you see Jesus saying, except a man be born of water, because when people ask you, what does it mean to be born again? You know, because Nicodemus, Nico asked Jesus, he says, so am I going to go back in my mother's womb? No, Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm only saying you have to be born of water. Is that the real clock or someone is messing with us? Wow. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says forgetting the things that are behind. So all the time that has passed, let's just forget about it. Let's keep pressing forward. We're not moved by what we see. We're eternal beings. If you're not yet an eternal being, I want to pray for you today to be born again so you don't care about time anymore. Anyway, let's keep moving. People ask you, what does it mean to be born again? Jesus explained it. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus in verse 1 or 2. And in verse 3, Jesus responded and said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? So I'm going to explain that very quickly. I know it's a digression, but I believe we need to harm, uh, we need to be armed rather with these things so that we know exactly how to take care of questions that get in the way of the gospel. You know, sometimes you just want to preach the gospel, but people want to debate and ask you questions. The quicker you can shut down those questions, the quicker you will be able to deliver the gospel, right? And so the guy came and Jesus says, you must be born again because if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is such that you have to see it first. You can't just stumble on it. You have to see it. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. And then Nicodemus was like, uh, born again as a grown man. Do I go back into my mother's womb? Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not what I mean. In verse 5, what does he say? He said, except a man, verily, verily, I say unto you, 
except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot what? Enter into the kingdom of God. So when you're born again, you can see the kingdom. But when your born again process is now complete, which means you are now born of the spirit, you can now enter. What is the difference? God only recognizes when you walk in the spirit. If you are not in the spirit, as far as God is concerned, you are not walking. So you can see the kingdom of God all day long. Because now you're born again. You believe that Jesus came to die for your sins and he is the only begotten son of God. Yes, when you believe that and you confess that with your mouth, it makes you born again. And then the kingdom of God appears and you can see it. But if you're not walking in the spirit, you cannot enter it. Does it make sense? So it's not when you start speaking in tongues. Because some people say, well, when you're born again, you can see the kingdom of God. And when you start speaking in tongues, that means you can now enter. No. Some people are speaking in two tongues, not even just one. And still, they cannot enter the kingdom of God because to enter the kingdom of God requires for you to walk across the divide because the Bible says there is a chasm between here and there. And the only way you can overcome and reduce the chasm to nothing to press in is by walking in the spirit. So what does it mean to be born of water? When Adam was made, Adam was made out of the dust of the earth and the dust of the earth was born again. Let me explain what that means. When God was about to make everything, everything was all water. It was a water world. And the Bible says he created space in between the volume of water. He says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, separating the waters from the waters. So there was water above the firmament. He called it heavens. And there was water below the firmament. He called it seas. But still, no man. A man is not going to come out of water. You understand what I mean? Man needed to come out of the ground. And so what did he do? The Bible says the Lord called forth the what? The land to come from inside the water. The land itself is born of water. You understand what I mean? The land itself is born of water. And why did God do that? God could have brought his own dust from heaven. But that dust would be alien upon the earth. So for full validity and authority, the earth that would produce the man itself had to be born of water, brand new, so that it has no other claim to citizenship in any geography outside of the one that it was born in. And so God made man from that dust. And he ensured that every other man that would come out of Adam would come from exact same process. That is the reason why you cannot have a human being born without being in water for nine months. Every single one of us, we are born of water. Does it make sense? Every single one of us are born of water. And so when Jesus says, except a man be born again, he was making it very clear that all those fallen angels who left their original position in heaven who lost their citizenship because of rebellion and came to earth to mess with the daughters of men, God made sure that they did not cheat the system by suddenly claiming to be born again. You know when they were kicked out of heaven, the Bible says that their place was no more. So they were like, okay, it's okay, we got you. We're just going to go hang around on the earth because they knew that there was a plan for salvation. Why? Because before the earth was formed, they were in heaven and they saw the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. Because the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world and the spirits were made on day one because they are light. So when God says, let there be light, there was a spectrum of spirits that were created. Even the spirit of trees were made on the first day before the trees themselves were made. Let me take that again slowly. You see, because many of us, when we read the creation account, we think God was doing magic. No, he wasn't doing magic. He was doing math. There was a process. It was science. Everything that he made that had a physical facade already had a spirit created before the body was made. Everything, including the trees. Everything. So when God says, let there be light on that very first day, and there was light, because when you read, the angels are called beings of light. 
The Bible says he made his ministers what? Fire. He made everything that was light that very first day. And so when he was making the tree, the tree was able to function because the spirits that run the trees already existed. So it was just resuming its place. And when he made man from the dust of the earth, guess what? His own spirit was already there from eternity past. And he breathed some of that into us. And that's how we became living beings. So when these beings fell, they already knew that there was salvation. But what they did not know that there was a condition for that salvation. And that salvation was only for the sons of men, those who are born of water. So if you come in here by some means, if you came here on a spaceship, if you came here, I, I say that because of the fact that there is already a plan by the Catholic Church endorsed by the current Pope to preach the gospel to the aliens when they come and they, will, they already said that they will baptize them when they show up. But you and I both know that these aliens are not from some other planet. They were those goons that were kicked out of heaven. The, the third of the angels that were kicked out of heaven. The Bible says, and their place was no more. Have you not read in scripture where the Bible says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth? Because the adversary, Satan, is falling. And he drew, Revelation chapter 12, down to the earth, a third of the angels in heaven. The Bible says when the dragon fell, a third of the stars of the heavens were in its tail. So they've been around looking for a place to call their own because God only made the heavens and the earth. If there was somewhere else, they would have gone there, but there is nowhere else. You understand what I mean? And so what is the deal? The deal is they've been trying to discredit us and disqualify us. The reason why they are out to tempt us all the time to make us rebel against God is because they want to stand in judgment and convince God that we should be gotten rid of because we're not good and they should be given the earth. That's why Satan doesn't like you. No, because sometimes, you know, you think about it, you're like, I was, I didn't ask to be born. What have I done to this Satan? Why does he hate me so much? He doesn't hate you because of what you have done or what you could possibly do. Satan hates you because of who you are. You are a man made in the image and in the likeness of God. And that qualifies you to inherit the earth, particularly if you are in Christ. You understand what I mean? And so Jesus had to tell Nicodemus, because Nicodemus was of the order of the Pharisees. Now that's important, right? Because if Nicodemus was a Sadducee, Jesus would have answered him differently. Sadducees did not believe that the spirits were made on day one. They didn't even believe in spirits, period. They believed that everything is very physical and natural. The moment you die, that's it. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That was the Sadducees. But the Pharisees believed in everything. The Pharisees knew that as we live on earth, there are beings who are physical, but have the technology to make themselves invisible. They know that they are around. They even know some of them by their names, right? The Pharisees were the ones who said Jesus was casting out demons by Beelzebub because they understood that there was a ranking even in the world of darkness amongst the flying be beings. Beelzebub is called the Lord of the Flies. Why did they call them flies? Because those beings are shapeshifters. They can fly, they can crawl, they can swim, they can do just about anything because they were not made of clay, just like you and me. They were made from a wider spectrum of elements and so they can choose whatever form they want to take. That's why Jesus, that's why the Bible warns us against Satan and his messengers. He says, be careful because they disguise themselves as angels of light. They can take whatever form. They lost their glory when they were kicked out of heaven. In their natural states, they are idiots looking people. But because they have the ability to transform and shape shift, they can continue to deceive people. So Jesus said to, Pharisee, to the Pharisee Nicodemus, because he knew what he was thinking. So he said to him, forget about all those people. 
This being born again thing is only for people who are human, who are born of water, who will not stop at being born of water, who will go on then to be born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? When you are born naturally from your mother's womb, you are born of water. That is the natural birth. To be born of the Spirit requires for you to activate your belief system. The belief system is the switch that enlightens your soul. And the moment you believe, the Bible says, now confess with your mouth because the power of life and death is in the tongue. So the moment you confess with your mouth, that soul that is now ignited now gets connected. The Bible says, let me explain this to you. You're wondering, why do, why do I need to be connected if I can be ignited? Every single one of us is walking, is walking around from the time we're born with a battery. And the Bible calls it a measure of faith. To every man, it has been given a measure of faith, enough for them to be able to believe in the Lord Jesus. So that is like you having a little battery that can turn you on for just a little bit, but you need to plug to the source, otherwise you cannot sustain it. And that is the reason why you find some people when they were much younger, they were open to the idea of the existence of God, but because nobody discipled them, nobody told them exactly how to go about it, they can no longer consider the existence of God. You talk to some adults now and they just can't comprehend it because that battery was powered off and on, off and on, until now they have lost it and they can no longer believe. That's why the Bible says be careful or be mindful of those who once walked amongst you as brothers and sisters in the faith who have now turned to rebellion because it is harder for you, it is easier for you to bring in an unbeliever than to restore them. Because the unbeliever hasn't used his own chances, but they have used theirs. They have plugged into the source. They have done away with the battery. So when they disconnect themselves from the source, it will take a miracle for them to come back. That's why Paul says, you need to run this race with fear and with trembling. Not because God is a terrible God, but just because what he has given to you is so precious, you don't want to joke with it. Anyway, that is what it means to be born again. So the next time somebody asks you, tell them when you came here, you came of water, which is great because that means you have an opportunity to repent and be saved. Let me tell you something. I've told you all this before and I'm just going to say it again real quick for the benefit of those of you who are very difficult people that you have been trying to preach to and they keep telling you, oh God, if God is so good, why did he get so angry just because a man and his wife ate an apple or ate some kind of fruit? You understand what I mean? Because you know people will paint you that picture of God being such a temperamental, angry spirit that you know cannot even take a little joke. You understand what I mean? I'm not saying what Adam and Eve did was a joke, but I'm talking about the fact that some people just think about God as just so very temperamental. Oh, you eat the fruit, get out of here. God drove them out of the garden positioned a cherub, installed a flaming sword. You know, God didn't just put a cherub there. God also put a flaming sword. That sword is automatic. It spins on its own. The cherub was just there to monitor the situation, right? And so when God did all of that, he did all of that because he didn't want them to go back into the garden and he said it. He says, lest the man reaches out his hand to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. And when we were children, we were like, that wouldn't be so bad. In fact, Jesus would not have had a need to come, right? But guess what God was avoid, uh, preventing us from? The moment man fell, man was in the lowest state of existence. He became less than an animal in some regard. Animals don't require clothes. They can manage their own affairs. They have instinct enough to know when there will be an earthquake and they will fly in another direction. But human beings are not that clever. They stay there and they get buried unless the weatherman tells them on television. We need clothes because we get cold very easily. You understand what I mean? And so man was in the lowest form of existence. If he had eaten of the fruit of the tree of life, he would have become an eternal being in that state. Irredeemable. Why is Satan irredeemable? Because he was already an eternal being when he fell. Why are the fallen angels never going back to heaven? Because they were already eternal beings when they fell. 
But man was a mortal. And that is the reason why he was redeemable. So let me tell you something. From these two examples that I've given, do you not see now that a lot of what you think are your disadvantages are actually heaven's special packaging to make you forever unique? Don't envy the angels. Don't, the Bible says when Satan was made, it was made of precious stones. You were made out of clay. Wow, what a slap. Oh yeah, what a slap. But do you know the reality of it is that the precious stone is already, the precious stones are already at this level. The glory of God is somewhere up there, right? And so when you're already at this level, you can only take the glory between here and there. But when you are made out of clay, you are at the very bottom. So you have more room for the glory of God. Because the glory of God will fill every room that is available. That's why the Bible says you must decrease so that he can increase. So if you think about it, being made out of clay is actually not a bad thing. It's a great thing because it makes more room for God. That is the reason why you and I cannot truly be full of ourselves. Satan fell because he was full of himself. He was doing wondrous things. But you and I, whenever we're about to feel like we have arrived, you know, because God gave you like two prophetic words and they have come to pass. Now you start feeling like when Gabriel comes to town next time, he needs to come to your house first. The next time they're having a meeting in heaven, if they don't call you, they can't start the meeting. You know how we begin to feel very cool with ourselves very quickly. Don't worry, God knows how he does his things. He will allow something to happen that will humble you. When Paul was prophesying like crazy, he was like, man, I have arrived. I can even tell you what angels are saying in heaven right now. You know, he said that. He said, I know a man, whether in the flesh or outside of the flesh, he has seen visions of angels, of heaven and of holy angels, and even heard words that must not be uttered. He says, I've heard things that I can't even tell you. <laughs> you. <laughs> He said, but I do not glory in this one. He said, but I glory in my infirmities. He said, because through the darkness of my infirmities, the light of the anointing will shine. He says, I have come to glory in what I am not so that I can be what he is. You see, many of us, we fail to realize that God has messengers in our lives that keep us humble. Paul says, three times I have sought the Lord to take this infirmity from me. He said, but the Lord has refused. He said, and now I know why. He said, because this thing has become a messenger of the opposition that humbles me. It is awesome to be human. It is amazing to do the human things that we do. We're not supposed to stay there. We're not supposed to say, well, since I'm human, I'm just going to continue to swim in the mud. No, what it means is, look, as long as I am human, and I am striving toward righteousness, there is grace for me. But some people do not enjoy that grace. Anyway, I got to all of that because I was talking to you about the fact that you are an adopted child of God and it's a great privilege because it allows you to have authority on the earth and authority also in heaven. I want us to wrap it up at this point other things that i want to say to you i'll say it later because my wife's reminding me with just by looking through one corner of her eye that it's a school week and there are people here whose children have to go to school and people who have to drive to the other side of the world but i want to say this before i go the two things that i've told you so far please take it to heart you are a very privileged being there is no other being in all of existence that has the privilege of salvation and you do, even though you live in the lowest level of existence. The earth is the lowest level, all right? Hades is sub-zero, okay? So because some people are like, hey, we're still better than hell. Yeah, yeah, I know. Hades is sub-zero, but the earth is kind of like zero level, right? In fact, when God was about to make the earth, what did he do? He drew the letter zero. Proverbs chapter 8, the Bible says, before the Lord formed the primal dust of the earth, he drew a circle upon the face of the deep. This is ground zero, okay? But in spite of being here and with all the weaknesses that we have, we are still privileged to be named by the name of God. When we become born again and we walk in the spirit, do you know that we are exactly like the Lord Jesus? The Bible says that we were born anew, regenerated by grace 
to be conformed to the express image of the Lord Jesus. And what is that express image of the Lord Jesus? That express image of the Lord Jesus is called the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We are so privileged, but we are not aware of it. We just need to keep reminding ourselves. Let me tell you something. A lot of the difficulty in your Christian journey is going to go away if you would just adopt this principle of allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work of reminding you of who you are. Now, let me say this. Because the Holy Spirit, his primary assignment is to remind you. But someone cannot remind you of what you don't already know. So if you are saying, oh, I don't enjoy the ministry of the Holy Spirit like this brother Moses says, but, but I, yet I speak in tongues. I know that I have the Holy Spirit, but I don't enjoy that sweet fellowship the way he's like, oh, God showed me that Messiah will come and stay next to me. He showed me this, he showed me that. Well, maybe the Holy Spirit wants to remind you of stuff that he expects that you already know that you don't. Spend time in the word of God. Find out what the Bible says about you. Find out the different types of children that God has. See the ones that are close to you in makeup and begin to learn from them how God has dealt with them in the past. It will fast track your development process by getting familiar with the dealings of God in the lives of other people. The more you read about yourself in the word of God, the more you give the Holy Spirit the raw materials with which to be able to speak to you the mind of God. Let me tell you something. You cannot hear the spoken word of God if you are completely ignorant of the written word of God. When Jesus started his ministry, what did he start with? The written word of God. When Satan came to tempt him, he kept saying, it is written. If Jesus had to quote what was written, the first time Jesus had a public appearance, he did not speak of his own until he had read what was written in prophecy concerning him. And all he did when he was speaking to Satan was speak what he read. Imagine how powerful you and I can be if we would just study that word of God some more. So that every situation that comes your way, you know what the word of God has said. When you find yourself struggling to pay your bills, when you find yourself struggling to have other people accept you, do you know so many people struggle today, particularly the young ones? You may want to save this and share it with your children. The struggle with being accepted. And you're like, oh my God, why, why wouldn't they just accept me? When Paul went through rejection, what did he say? He sought the Lord. And when he sought the Lord, he found himself in God's family picture. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm already accepted. And so if these people reject me, they are the ones missing out. So he declared and he started to shout, I am accepted in the beloved. I am accepted in the beloved. You see, the moment I saw that scripture, I became immune to rejection in a lot of ways. Oh yeah, I was at the university at the time. And there were a group of people who wanted to snub me because I wasn't a member of their social circle. And so I will look at them and I will feel sorry for them because I am accepted in the beloved. So if I'm not with you, that means you're not with us. You are not beloved. You understand what I mean? I remember there was one day the chief of one of the social clubs at my university. I happen to have gone to the university where a lot of rich people send their children. So they had all kinds of things with which they oppress one another. And so there was this guy, he was a club chief. So he came to me and he was like, there was something about you. We ignored you for so long, but you, it didn't affect you. I said, but it affected you. Because you came to meet me. And then I invited him to a meeting that we were organizing. And him and all of his boys and their little girls followed them to the party. And several people gave their lives to Christ. What am I saying? What I am saying is by just having a revelation that God says I am accepted, it's over. When the Bible says, do not worry about anything because worrying does not deliver. Do you know what that would do to you? That would suddenly expose to you the illusion and the deception of worrying. Many of us, Satan has sold worrying to us as a sense of responsibility. Satan tells you that, well, I mean, you, you're responsible for this person, for that person, for this and for that. So you think you're responsible and that's why you want to find out the solution. But guess what? You might be responsible for certain things, but God is responsible for you. So the moment you think about all the things you're responsible for, you're like, oh, great. I've identified all the stuff that God needs to take care of. I say, God, behold your assignment. These children have to go to school. This house has to be built. 
this leg has to be healed because I am not as useful to God when I cannot function as I can be when I am functional. You understand what I mean? So when your car is indicating that it needs fuel, the car doesn't have to go and save money to buy fuel for itself. You buy the fuel because you need the car to be at its best. God needs you to be at your best. But if you keep denying him the privilege of taking over responsibility, then it's on you. The last thing that I'm going to say is in the book of Isaiah. If I, let me spare you Isaiah today. Let's just go to Romans very quickly. We're just going to go to Romans chapter 11 and hopefully we'll break bread with that scripture. Romans chapter 11. God is good. So finally, my wife's prayer, one of my wife's prayers got answered today because she's been asking me for a couple of years now to teach on what it means to be born again. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to do a little video. I did a video on YouTube. After two years, only 27 people have seen it. So maybe this is what I should have done. I should have just said it here. And there you have it. Maybe we'd even talk about it a little bit more later. We're going to read Romans chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, but we're going to read it in reverse order, and you're about to see why. Romans chapter 11, chapter, I mean, verse 3 says, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I alone am left and they seek my life. A couple of days ago, I think about two days ago, the, the Lord said to me, he says, you are in the season of I alone am left. Many of the things that the Holy Spirit will be leading you and I to do the rest of 2023 will be different from what everybody else around us is doing. And it's okay. We have come to the season of I alone I am left. I'm alone, I'm left. Where is this coming from? Remember the story of Job. Every time there was an attack on the properties of Job, only one person survived every time to tell of what has happened. Because God needs for them to be witnesses of when the blessing of Job comes. Because there needs to be people to say, you know what, there was a time that he lost 10 camels. I was there. And now he's gained 20. You see, God is preparing you to be a witness. And that is the reason why it is okay if it is just you alone that survives to tell the tale. We have come to the season of I alone am left. God wants to equip us and to prepare us to be comfortable and to be confident even when we're doing things that are not part of the consensus of opinions. I'm encouraging you today. Because this is that express word from the Lord for the body of Christ to know. I'm encouraging you not for views, not for fame, but for the, for the equipping of the saints. I want you to share this word with somebody that you know outside of this fold. Share this with somebody who may not be as supported as you are with such a company of people that God has raised to be seers and prophets in this time. Let them know that we have come to the season of I alone am left. So that if you are alone, if you are the only one that is saying no to evil corporations, if you are the only one that is saying no to fear, if you are the only one that is saying no to remaining to remaining blind to the deception. Feel comfortable because one with God is a majority. Feel confident to take a stand even if it's not popular. Feel confident to take a stand even if you're ridiculed for it. Feel confident to take a stand because God is not looking for the multitude. He's looking for the faithful. <clears throat> now let us read verse 2. Now you see why we're reading it in reverse. I have water so my wife has no chance of telling me off today. Look at what verse 2 says. It says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with, <clears throat> with God against Israel saying, the reason why we read it in reverse order is this. I kind of just mentioned to the Lord, I said, um, you know, we have been teaching on supplication. What do we have? And this is one of the things that the Lord's given to me. <clears throat> you see, this man, even though he was pleading against Israel because of where they had been, he prayed the prayer of supplication. And we have been praying the prayer of supplication. 
You know, I've been teaching around it and I hope you have been praying it. On Saturday, you saw how my wife came here with a totally different mind of what to do. But the Holy Spirit led her to pray a prayer of supplication. It was an humble plea <clears throat> unto the Lord. So here is the deal. The Lord is giving us this insight ahead of many. Because we have sought him in supplication. And he's saying, get ready. Because you are coming to the season of I alone, I am left. When you feel like that, for some of you, it's going to start in your dreams. You will start seeing yourself walk away from things and walk away from people. <clears throat> even in your dreams, you will begin to develop the desire to stand out and not put your resources where everybody is putting their resources. Certain ideologies are about to become very popular in the next couple of weeks because of the economy. Everyone is going to be saying, oh, this is what you do. This is what you do. They will be sounding like they have the um, authority on the wisdom for the times that we're in. Do not follow them unless you know that the Holy Spirit is leading you. Let me tell you something. The way you will be led without second guessing yourself is if you are already prepared to do it, even if it's just you. So we're going to break bread today, but when you have time, I want you to go on your own and study the book of Micah. If you haven't read the book of Micah in a while, Micah has been sent to us <clears throat> once again. And he is going around very, very humbly. Micah is not to be heard Loud, yeah, it's a wonderful name. But <clears throat> let me just give you an insight very quickly as we break bread. You see Micah um, chapter 7. Alrighty. So Micah chapter 7 um, verse 4 says, The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn, than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchmen and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. So this is Micah chapter, one, chapter 7, uh, verse 4. Two things here that don't, that don't seem to go together. He says, the day of your watchman, of your watchman, and your punishment comes. I want to say this to you folks. <clears throat> we're in a mix. We're in, a, we're in mystery Babylon. Babylon means, means confusion by mixing. Things are being mixed right now. It is the time of their punishment, but it is also your time because you're a watchman. Study Micah chapter 7. Read that entire chapter. Find yourself in it and begin to align yourself with what God has for you in this season. We're going to see God's judgment upon a system of rebellion, upon the children of disobedience. But those same happenings that come to expose the wickedness of the world will result in the exaltation of the ones who are waiting upon the tower of intercession to see the Lord and to see the glory of God revealed in the saints. The time of the watchman is now. My time is now. Praise the Lord. Because my light is come. So I want to encourage you, tap into that express delivery. It is an express delivery. Because everything that we need is already on its way. It's already about to be delivered. It is the time of the watchman. It might be the time of perplexity for the children of disobedience. But it is the time of the watchman. And it might not be a popular thing to say. But I alone am come. And I want to encourage you that in the mighty name of Jesus. That you would not seek the company of men at the expense of the company of the Holy Spirit. Let us receive the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Hallelujah. I don't even know how it took us so long today, but again, we'll blame it on Christian. God is good. Alrighty, so let's go. Father, in Jesus' name. Oh, we're not to rush this one. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Genesis 7.27. We cannot rush this one. We can get out of here quickly, but we will not rush this one, says the Lord. So Genesis 7.27, and I'm going to say this because my desire is to prophesy over several people today personally. But Genesis, yeah, there's a Genesis 7. Genesis chapter 7, verse 27. Genesis chapter 7. Oh, I beg your pardon. Let's look at 17. You know, the last time that was exactly what I did too. I mixed it up. Genesis 17, 27. Alrighty, that's the one. 
And he said, and all the men of his house, born in the house, or bought with money from the foreigner, were circumcised with him. Now, I told you that there is a mixing going on in the world. The, it is the time of the watchmen, but it is also the time of punishment and perplexity for the ones who are without. One thing that we also know in Luke 17, Jesus told us that a time is coming wherein the eagles will gather where the body is. Who are the eagles? The eagles are the ones who have been waiting on the Lord. The likes of Michael, of Gabriel, the saints that have gone to be with the Lord, the likes of Apostle Paul, Abraham. All of those folks are coming down to be with us. We are the body. We are the Samar. That was the word that Jesus used. He says, where the body is, there the eagles will gather. So that includes those who are born in his house up there and those of us who are adopted here from this foreign system. Together, we will put away every limitation. The Bible says the ones born in his house and the foreigner together shall all be circumcised. To be circumcised means to put off this corruptible flesh, to put off the foreskin. We are coming to a time wherein we are going to be operating side by side with angelic beings and with saints that have gone ahead of us. So be prepared to have divine visitations. So I want to encourage you, the sons from above, the sons of God, and those of us who are adopted here by the Holy Spirit, we are all going to put away every limitation of the flesh. You see, every one of those decisions. Okay, I'm going to pray for somebody. You see, I noticed since you sat there that there is a riddle that needs to be solved. And that riddle is you want to truly see that which is of God and that which is of you. You see what I mean? There are certain voices that you hear in decision-making that sometimes overpower your will. And that is the voice of your human nature, of your carnal self. You're about to receive the strength to be able to put it in its place so that your decisions are quick and express. On Saturday, God gave us a word you were not here, but you were part of that word. And that we have come, and it is what? That we have come to a season of quick and effective decisions. You will make quick decisions. That will be the right decisions. There will be no debate between your heart and your flesh on what the Lord is saying because that foreskin has been put away. You will hear, you will know, and you will see even the outcome because other people who would question your every decision will not be able to do that because with the same express obedience that your spirit is responding to God, men will respond to you. Things will respond to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray that all, I wish all, I mean, I hope everybody else is tapping into that word. You see, because let me tell you something, the days of dilly-dallying is over. The days of saying, ah, oh, okay, I'm going to fast for three days because I want to know if this is God or if this is not. No, 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 no. I'm not saying you don't fast anymore, but what I am saying is now you will hear that voice telling you this is the way because the foreskin has been put off. If you're ready to tap into that, I want to encourage you to tap into the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that is in your hands as we break bread. Father, we thank you because this is the body of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. All right, okay. There is a balance. There's one more scripture. Matthew 14, 12. I think more of us need to meditate on it because we've come to it a couple of times now. So we're just going to do it this one more time and I hope that's it. Matthew 14, 12. It says, Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. He says what? The disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. This is the body of John the Baptist that they're talking about. They put away the body of John the Baptist and they came to tell Jesus. I want to encourage you. There is a language of John the Baptist. It's called the language of the witness. I haven't got time to respond to your dream just here, but you can glean something from here, Alan. So if you're wondering what is the language of John the Baptist, what are the words of the Baptist? The words of the Baptist are the words of the witness. When you speak, even though you are the only one. You understand what I mean? Even though you are the only one, John the Baptist was a lone ranger, but he didn't let that deter him at all. He still spoke anyway. The significance of this scripture as we break bread today is this. 
We are putting away the body of the lone witness so that we can function fully in the spirit of the lone witness. There is something about putting the body away to function in the spirit because that means your limitations are done away with. Even though they thought they could sniff the life out of the witness of John the Baptist, they could only kill his body. The testimony kept on going. So I want to encourage you as we break bread today that you will be ready to bury the body, bury the flesh, bury that which is of the, of the flesh and take on boldly that which is of the spirit. So you have been led by the spirit always in full discernment because it is your season. Oh, watchman. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus. As we eat of the body of the Lord today and drink of his blood, we do so in remembrance of him. Be glorified in the highest. Be glorified in the highest. Before you eat, I feel like, I know we're pressed for time. Bear with me. Even if they have less hours of sleep tonight, they will have as much rest as they need. God did not promise you many hours of sleep. He only promised you rest. You can sleep for 10 hours and not be rested. So today we're going to tap into the rest, but we're not going to leave until we have done this one assignment. I see a burden that is dangling by a cord. It's been severed, but it's still dangling. So there is a burden in here that needs to be completely broken tonight. So come with me to Mark eleven twenty-seven. 27. Mark 11, I believe it's verse 27. Mark, but I know it's Mark 11. Verse 27, and this is what he says. And I want you to be very attentive in your spirit. Every burden that has become a stubborn burden, it's been there for so long that I can smell it. I smell the burden. It's been there. It's supposed to have been done away with, but it's still dangling. And it is a burden of shame. It is something that brings you shame even when you think about it. And so today, it is not just going to be severed more. It is going to be cut off completely. The Bible says, then they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. This was when they came to question by what authority he was doing things. These are the agents of shame. The people who keep calling you out, who keep seeking to expose your shame. You are walking in the temple. You are in the will of God. But because they are religious, busy body, witchcraft people, they think it is their business to keep finding fault in you. The ax is laid to the root today. The Egyptians that you see today, you will see them no more. The Lord is silencing the voice of the opposition in your life. The religious order of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those ones who put themselves upon a high pedestal of sanctimonious behavior, holier than thou. Today, that shame is loosed completely from your life. There is already a fire of God's judgment waiting to burn it. No longer will you be afraid to make a move because of what somebody will say. You will post what you want. You will say what the Lord wants you to say and you will not be afraid of tongues barking at you or lashing at you because your shame has been taken away. No reproach remains on your face. You have been called to stand and the Lord has foreknown you because the Bible says that whom the Lord foreknew, he predestined. And because you have been foreknown, you will stand even if you are the only one. You will stand. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. You know some people, when God does things for you, you can't even tell them because they will remind you of certain things that you have done that does not even merit the favor of God. And you're like, oh, I wish I could say this, but people will remember that. No, I say to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Whoever you are, key into this word tonight. You didn't come here tonight just to go back home the same. You came tonight because God wants to rid you of that shame and his word has come forth. The Lord gives his word and the word of the Lord heals them freely. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may now eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood.
Praise the Lord. Alrighty, while Alan is still busy there, I'm just going to receive the offerings and just uh, say a word of blessing over it. Um, we're not going to take too much time, so please be, let's be quick about it, but still very honoring because we're not just giving to check a box. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We're honoring the Lord with our substance. And I want to encourage you. The Bible says to him who has more shall be given. And the one who has none, even that which he has will be taken away. So please do not come before the Lord and say, well, I do not have, I don't have enough. No, be the one who has. And let the Lord take care of the fulfillment of his promise. He has made a promise to you that he will increase your seed sown. And I pray that every offering that is being presented tonight will be received as a sweet smelling savor before the Lord. Let us give out of the generosity of our hearts by the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're not giving to meet needs. We're not giving, giving primarily out of compulsion or to meet needs. No, we're giving primarily because we love the Lord. We appreciate what he's doing amongst us and we just want to say thank you and honor him. So with all that gratitude and Jesus' joy, let us give cheerfully. And Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this house that receives these offerings in your name. Lord, let there be more fruits continually that have been born in here and that have been born from here in the mighty name of Jesus. And for every single one of us that responds in obedience to your word to honor you today, Father, in Jesus' name, none of us will lose our reward. We will receive exceedingly abundantly above that which we have asked or imagined in the name of Jesus. As we give, it shall be given unto us good measure that is pressed down and shaken together. That's how men will give unto our bosom because you will command them to. You have commanded them to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So if there are any announcements, they're going to be on the screen. Anything pressing in particular, God is good. So Saturday, we're here again from 6.30. Remember, on Saturdays, we're not eating first. I say that for your sakes especially. We just come right into service. So 6.30, please be here, be on time, and bring somebody along. God is doing great things amongst us. It is the time of the watchman, and you don't want to be told. You want to behold. God bless you.